know, we have the next one, which, uh, how did that go, though? The, the, Yeah, so the home would tell me, but I think, mm -hmm. at least for me, to do things quickly, I think you have lots of practice. You don't need enough people at home. I mean, you're running, right? And that's fine. Yeah, yeah. This needs to be a good part of it. Things you can read about. Uh, the one thing was about the specific feet. Let me just touch on that one. So, um, I think several of you got this that in, a, in an insulator, the main degrees that carry uh, energy are the phonons. So, you're going to get a phonon specific heat, which goes like to you. But now, what about the electronic part? And what I was looking for is something like this, just the fact that there is a gap in the spectrum. You don't need to know the whole behavior, it could be something more complicated, but basically because there is a gap, you would say, you know, the uh, specific heat, which is what? Uh, D, E, D, T. So you're changing the temperature and you're asking how is the energy changing? Well, the energy cannot change because the, um, you know, the system has a gap. So you are starting with a ground state, which is filled valence bands, empty conduction bands, and now the energy cannot change because uh, nothing is getting excited across the gap when temperature is less than delta. So the specific heat is greatly suppressed. And just keep this in mind, it will come up in other contexts, like a superconductor also has a gap. Its specific heat will be similarly suppressed. And then you think, okay, as it gets excited across the band gap, and you get more, and those carriers are now pretty de non-degenerate, right? Because you have a very dilute set of carriers, so it's pretty classical. So you can just say, okay, we, once they get excited, it should sort of look like a constant, because now you are in a, like a gas of uh, classical atoms. And uh, classical atoms have a specific heat which is three halves kV, so that's the constant. So some argument like that, okay? <clears throat> of course, if you excite more and more, you might think now it is starting to become degenerate. But, you know, so then it becomes more complicated in, in any real situation, so you have to analyze that. But broadly, these are the two cases. Okay, so that's... And then, okay, compare it with a degenerate metal. And the thing to point out is the specific heat in a degenerate metal is always much less than what it is in a non-degenerate metal. Is degenerate and non-degenerate clear? Some people were not clear about that, so just go over that definition again. So in a degenerate metal, when you have a Fermi C, all the electrons are not contributing to the specific heat. So most of them are, uh, are what is called Pauli block. And then it's only that shell that contributes. So this specific heat is actually, you can also write it as C classical times T over Tx. 
So it's suppressed by that factor T over T f. Okay. That's one question, and I think pretty much the other ones are fine. Um, you can look at the calculation for the momentum carried by a photon as opposed to a phonon, and it comes down to, um, you know, for a 1 eV um, band gap, you can find the lambda for that photon, and it turns out to be about 1 micron. And you want to compare that to lambda of a typical phonon, and by typical I mean, you know, we can have phonons of various wavelengths. Right? Because we have omega versus k. So you're going from very long wavelengths to very short ones. The short ones have higher momentum. And the shortest ones will be on the order of the lattice constant. So that's five angstroms. <clears throat> so just the fact that they carry four orders of that there are four orders of difference in magnitude for the wavelength then tells you the momentum will be four orders of magnitude difference. And you can just go from there. Right. So they're in momentum and lambda are inversely related as we know. Okay, another question about the effective mass. So um, you know, so if you for, so some of you got this definition uh, backwards. I mean, you wrote m star equal to d two e by d k squared. So there's no reason to remember that. You just go back to your plane wave. Epsilon is k squared over 2m, and just from that, differentiating, you get a mass. It's exactly that, except you put m star instead of m, because you're allowing for a general dispersion. You're allowing for an epsilon of k, which is not just k squared, but can have some band structure. And then, essentially, if the curvature is positive, you have a positive mass. If it's negative, either due to holes or at the top of a band, these are the two places where it could become negative, at B and at C. Okay. And then typically the mass will depend on the curvature, but it will typically be due to band structure. The mass will be less than 1, the magnitude of the mass. If you find it is greater than 1, like Ashcroft and Merman has some tables in the beginning, it's usually greater than 1 because of interactions. Because an electron will drag a cloud around along with it, coming from the other quasi-particles. And it will make it heavier because of interactions. Band structure will typically go the other way. OK, so that's uh, another question where some things could be clarified. And then the last part, I think there was <clears throat> about uh, having a very, uh, a PN junction where N was heavily doped literally going all the way to a metal. And so all you want to do is go back to the depletion width, which says that the doping in the N uh, uh, layer times the depletion in N is equal to Na times dP. So obviously, if the doping is very large, you, can, uh, you want to, so this is some fixed amount. Right? NADP is some fixed doping on the P side, sorry, P side. So on the N side, if you make this very large, this has to correspondingly be very small. Um, so it's literally you squeeze the depletion to adjust the very surface. And that's what happens in a metal, and it's what is called a Schottky barrier. So you don't need to know that it's a Schottky barrier, but just that in the metal, the depletion width will be very tiny. And then you, you just get this band bending in the P side. Okay. So this is an important uh, element, again, in um, various devices. OK, so that's go over it a little more. Um, and uh, see if you have questions, you can send me another email. OK, and I will post the phone on one very soon. I mean, it's ending, the quarter is ending, so you know, by Friday, for sure. OK, any other questions? On, on any, uh, so I want to now get to the paper, discussion of the paper, so that, uh, you know, I think that's what's on many people's minds. So let's see, um, I moved the, I have sent an email very recently, some of you may not have seen it, with all the submission uh, final dates and where to submit what. 
So you, you can look at your email for that. <coughs> so it has a, all the information about projects and everything. Uh, now, the reason I moved it is some people, you know, I don't want this class to be like a Mathematica class, but at the same time, we need to use some of Mathematica to build intuition. So some people were having difficulty with Mathematica, and I found out yesterday. So I decided to uh, move the date by two more days, so you have time. And what I, um, you know, there are many of, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, um, on the, you said you wanted us to turn in homework three again. Do you want us to also turn in the Mathematica part of that, like again, so two printouts of it, like one with the paper and one with? If it's just, just uh, no, don't burn it up. Okay. Just, uh, we will basically look at um, homework three. Uh, and if you have Mathematica, put the one version of that between the two. Okay, yeah, because as I say, I mean, I had turned it in before and I've now made corrections to my code. Yeah, so, so I could put the best one. Them, but, okay. Yeah. And also, we are not going to look at the code in detail. Okay, the main thing is we will grade the paper. Okay. Part of this whole thing, actually, it's a good exercise the way it went and uh, came about, but it happened because we could not read the solution. It was like too many uh, things just sort of dumped there and there was no digestion of the results. So that's why the paper idea came up. But in a way, it's very nice because it sort of builds on exactly how research happens. You'll see once you start taking data, reams and reams of data. Or if you're doing simulation, reams and reams of simulation. Or if you're doing analytical calculation, you're chasing all those factors of 2 pi and so on, reams and reams of, I'm saying reams because there was a time when I used computer paper output. We don't do that anymore. We don't have that fantastically long, you know, it's like very broad paper, it's not this 8 by 11, it's broad paper and it's reams of it, it's all attached. So you could just kind of go on with your calculations forever. But, um, so I have that picture in my mind because that's something I worked with for many, through my graduate school years. But um, in any case, uh, every aspect, experiments, simulation, theory, theoretical calculations have all gotten to be digested Finally, when you give a talk, you kind of give the final result, and then you hope people will at least be interested in that. You know, once if you describe the details of calculation, nobody will uh, be interested. And then if they grab that hook, then you open other boxes depending on what. So it'll give you uh, some flavor, and I think some many of you are probably already doing research, so you have some of that idea. Okay, so what do I? So to help uh, in this process, I asked. Mason to uh, just talk a bit about his code, so you can see some elements of it. Uh, I thought I can tell you I didn't it. No, I have forgotten to load it. Mason, do you have it on stick? No. Uh, okay. How can I forget to load that? I'm going to do about construction of work. Uh, that was notes. Uh, that was notes. Uh, I really wanted you to show that because that's kind of helpful. Okay, let me see what we can do. Uh, I need to keep up a bit there. Or I just do something real fast. How? You have it? Well, I could just write. I mean, if, if Mathematica is on this computer. No, that's the uh, problem. Yeah. That, that's what gets every time this thing corrupted. I doesn't have Mathematica, so I uh, specifically made him make it. Um, here's something you can do. Robert, you are a resourceful fellow. Yes. I want you to go to my office, and I'll give you my uh, my password. Um, so Is it on your... It's on my laptop. It's on your laptop, but I know the password. Oh, you know the password. Yeah. <laughs> and, and here's my key. See, I'm trusting you with everything. Yes. Here's my key. My laptop, you know the password? Yeah, it H, H? Yeah, no, that it's one. that H one. Yeah. And it's on the desktop, and it'll be called 880. something uh, and dot PDF. There will be a dot NB and a dot PDF. All right. So get the one which is the dot PDF. Just open it once to see that it has. Make sure that it's... What would it say on the first page? Um, it should say initialization at the top. Okay, initialization. So just All right. take a look. All right, I'll take that, and I'll just put it on Carmen. 
uh, you could put it on carbon. The best thing is if you can uh, bring it uh, on a stick. Do you have a stick? I should have one. Okay, if you don't have a stick, bring it, uh, put it on carbon. How All will right. you put it on, on the carbon page? Can you load it? Yeah. Okay. I can put it on there. And it's not going to interfere with the fact that I've opened it and all the rest of it. No, you'll just need to refresh that. Okay. Okay, so why don't I start with where we left off? Oh, can I ask another question? Yeah. Well, so I was having trouble finding experimental data to compare it to. So I wanted to get some suggestions on okay. what to search Let for. Let me see if anybody in the class has been successful. Anyone? No? Have you looked? I a while looking, but I can't, I'm not getting, I, could, I found a few papers that have some density. Let me, let me ask you, how do you look? Let's, uh, um, where do you go? Well, first I was looking at Web of Science, but that was getting to be a little thick, so I was using Google Scholar, and yeah. I was just searching for lattice defects and, dens lattice defects and density of state. Okay, and so then you did the right thing. Okay. I wanted to be sure you tried. Yeah, and okay. skimming through abstracts before, and then looking at papers for the okay. pictures, and okay. I was sending Google. What I will do is, I will post one paper, okay. I, because there's no time now to say do this and try this, I'll post one paper and I want you to just take a look at that paper and make your own comments about it. Okay, okay. That, yeah, that would help. Just now, I'll tell you what will help me, because uh, time is short, I don't want to lose time by forgetting. Send me an email right after the class. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Okay, so let's put this up and come back to that last part which we had left off. Okay, why are we are here? Because I will... I want to get rid of the, the board. I, there's no place to write with that screen. So let me show you something which I'm going to do if, in terms of the order of my lecture today, a little bit later. But I'm going to do it uh, first because I have the computer and all set up right now. And this is uh, an aspect from Andy's talk last, was it last quarter? Last quarter. <coughs> and I'll tell you why I'm doing it because it's relevant. That's one of the things. Sometimes things become relevant in not exactly the same sequence in which we study things in the class. Okay, so just to refresh everyone's uh, minds, what we are looking at is magnetotransport. That's the topic. behavior of electrons in a magnetic field, in particular, not just as it relates to density of states, but as it relates to transport. And the first thing we saw yesterday was that it becomes a tensor, so you're applying, you're typically applying a current in this direction, and you are, uh, and, and a magnetic field out of the board, out of this uh, plane, of this of sample and it generates a voltage. So you have one voltage in this direction um, and then another voltage in that direction. So you, this is the generated voltage. So you have a V, uh, let's call it Vx. Uh, so you have applied Vx and it drives a current I and a measure so you can you can get something like r x x which is v x v x over i and you can also uh, it generates the b field deflects electrons and it finally drives a, a voltage which is a hall voltage which is in the transverse direction and so And that gives us R x y, which is V hall over I. I is always in the x direction. If you want, you can put an x there. Okay. Hall is in the y direction. And so that is the measurement. And what we got was uh, this situation where we had, um, let's say, we have a response, so um, so from the resistances we can get resistivities. 
which are without all the dimensional factors, and we get a matrix, which is rho xx, rho xy, minus rho yx, minus rho xy here, and rho uh, xx. <coughs> so I've assumed that there's no anisotropy, I've written the same thing. So the important thing is sigma is equal to, so I'm actually going to do it the other way, where I'm going to write the sigma matrix as well, with its elements, sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma xy, and sigma xx. Okay, and now a curious thing, which is something I mentioned yesterday, but I want to just repeat that. Um, if I write rho and sigma are related by the inverse, then you can show that uh, rho xy is sigma xy over general about uh, millimeter transport. Is everybody clear up to here? Um, this is coming from the determinant. Okay. Now uh, we will see how these play out in the context of uh, the quantum product that we can get to. But before that, so um, you know, so when when we looked at these quantities, we saw that there were plateaus in rho x y and in rho xx, there were these big sharp peaks. I'll come back to that. But I want to go back to what Andy uh, had, has, has, had done last quarter, where he looked at the behavior not at very large fields, but at small fields. Okay, so this stuff will basically latch on to our quantum Hall effect at higher fields. So let me do that first. So Andy should be doing this, but he has already done it in front of your class. And I'm only going to pick out a few things here. So the main part was um, I'm not going to go through all of these derivations, but just this much. Um, actually, I, I did decide I will do the land down level thing because there were sufficiently many people who hadn't done that. Okay, I think I'm going to come back to that at the cost of having to turn on the computers again. Is that a question? Yeah, you have PowerPoint up, it's easy. So you can just turn the, you can make the projector go black. Oh know, really? And I just did it? I just closed it? Yeah. So that's, that's fine, I can stop it. Okay. You're saying I could have just turned the PowerPoint black and you put PowerPoint up and press D on the keyboard? Yeah. Then you won't yeah, you won't okay. I will try to turn it on between now and when I need it. Okay, so let me use the board a little bit because I just wanted to uh, to set up that problem first. Uh, because without some of the details it wasn't going to, to make sense. Okay, so let me uh, sketch here. So I want to save this part here. So let me do that here. So here is, so the point is, uh, <coughs> experimentalists measure rho, okay? So this is what experiment measures. So today I want to focus on the theory behind quantum Hall effects. We have seen the phenomenology yesterday, I want to discuss today what is the cause of such a dramatic effect. And for that, I want to bring in sigma because that's what theorists work with. This is the quantity you actually calculate. And it seems they're just inverses, but that the meaning becomes very different, and I'll tell you where. So this is theory that deals with sigma. Okay, so let me plot sigma. So this is now in the 
sigma x y, which is now mu p squared over h. And here is mu. And mu is from the Killian factor. By that I mean it can happen in uh, MOSFETs. And I checked actually, the first uh, discovery paper by Klitzing, von Klitzing, was on silicon MOSFETs, um, not on gallium arsenide. That came later. And gallium arsenide was crucial to see the fractional effect because you could get much higher mobility. So sample type, and it could be, it could be a silicon MOSFET. Um, uh, it could be a gallium arsenide quantum well. It could even be graphene. So it could be many different materials where you can somehow produce a 2D electron gas. Graphene has wrinkles, there are differences, because when a density of states has special features, but it's all understandable. And it also does not depend on this. And sample type geometries that have been done in different geometries and on disorder. And disorder, provided disorder is weak. showed you, you should be uh, surprised by this picture here, because yesterday when I showed you were these plateaus, uh, those were plateaus for rho xy. So you think, okay, rho xy and rho x, uh, sigma xy are just inverses. And so I flipped this h over e square and mu has come to the top, so that's how it's behaving here. But I also showed you rho xx, right? And rho xx was zero and peaky, just like this. 
And now I'm drawing sigma xx, which should be inverse of rho xx. So this zero should have become an infinity, but it's not. Is everyone clear about that? Experiment measures rho xx. And I showed you those pictures with those big peaky things. Now I'm plotting sigma xx, and I'm drawing a very similar shape. And the reason is, from here it follows that um, rho xx and sigma xx are basically equal. In the quantum Hall state, measure rho xx. And now when we try to get a sigma xx, or you know, either, either way, so let me just forget that line here. Just from here, we see that rho xx will be equal to sigma xx over, actually I should do it the other way around, sorry. Uh, so in the quantum form state, our measure, our experiment is rho xy to be h over nu e squared, and rho xx is equal to zero. By quantum Hall state, I mean in the plateau region, the plateau states. <coughs> so this implies that sigma xx would be rho xx by a similar inversion over rho xx squared plus rho xy squared. Okay, so now you see that in the denominator, this is zero. This is finite. So I can basically ignore this in the denominator and write this as rho xx over some rho xy squared, which is a constant. It's this number there. So essentially, this implies sigma xx is basically proportional to rho xx. This is the only place you will see something as crazy as that. That resistivity and conductivity are the same, you know, up to a constant. But the reason I bring it up is the interpretation is completely different. And it, what we will try to focus on is understanding why is the conductivity zero. So that's why I brought, brought that's why it's important to um, go through the logic. The logic is experiment measures rho. But theoretically, we, can, we have an understanding of what conductivities do. It's a very different thing. If, if I ask you, explain why the conductivity is zero, or explain why the resistivity is zero, the mechanisms can be very different. So let me, let me, be, uh, let me try to explain that again. So what we are going to try to explain, want to explain, why is sigma xx tending to zero, okay? This would mean I want to somehow explain why is the system looking like an insulator? Because low conductivities are like our semiconductor story. It's looking like an insulator. So why is the quantum Hall state like a like an insulator. <clears throat> okay? Because had I been trying to explain why is rho xx zero, then I'm trying to explain why is the resistivity so small, which is more like a superconductor. So you're kind of going crazy here. What am I supposed to explain? Is the system like a superconductor or is it like an insulator? And what I'm trying to uh, say is the insight comes from theory in the following way. We will explain, and I will just come to that explanation, why conductivity is going to zero in this region here. Okay? Once we understand that, uh, it's going to zero because the system is becoming some kind of insulator, which I will describe. Once we understand that, we then resort to just mathematical properties of inverting a matrix with a denominator which is finite to get had sigma xy been zero, then indeed you get your usual result. Rho xx is one over sigma xx. It's only because sigma xy is finite that you get this result that rho x is, is proportional to sigma xx. So what we will do is next step is to explain 
why is sigma xx zero? Why is it like an insulator? Then resort to these matrix equations to get us why rho x is zero in the experiment. Okay? Is it clear? Okay. Now, um, for the explanation. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've lost sight of where the experiment is uh, lining up here. Um, so, sigma xx is the conductivity of it's whatever you apply. It's basically ex over jx. So, you know, I don't want to go to a hat. So, basically, let's, let's write that. Not sigma. You measure rho. So, uh, I can write that here. Rho xx. So, okay. I can write either one. So let me write it here. So Jx, J is equal to sigma E, right? That's our equation for relating currents and electric fields. So Jx is sigma Xx, Ex. And Jx is how much current is flowing in, in the, the X direction. Line. Right. Okay. So from I to J, you know, there's a current per unit area. So I'm getting rid of all those, uh, there's some dimensional factors. So sigma xx is relating current density to electric fields. Okay? Now, uh, a sigma xy is going to be j, so basically you have jx is now sigma xy dy. Wait, jx is? Yeah. This is a matrix equation, right? So J is a vector, sigma is my matrix, and E is my field. So I have Jx, Jy. Who wants to do Jy? No. Oh. No, it's just the added, basically. Oh. It's matrix multiplication through something. So let me let me let me let me write it like this. Jx. There's a jy, but jy has been set to zero. You don't want any current in the y direction. That is how the whole problem works out. You know, you don't, you're not driving, the electric field is actually balancing the current in the y direction. So jx, jy, but jy is zero. And then you have uh, sigma xx, um, and, and so you can add the two up actually. Sigma xy, sigma xy again with a minus sign and sigma xx because they are all they are equal and then we have e x e y okay so if i look at you know so from jx you get sigma xx e x plus sigma xy e y but then for the other one you just have this times this both the e x and e y are non zero but this current is zero okay so for the other one, you have uh, sigma xy ex plus, uh, you know, minus, and then here you have sigma xx ey is equal to zero. And that will give you a ratio between ex and ey. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so that's uh, the experiment. So when sigma xx is zero, what does that mean? Yeah, so that's what I'm coming to now. It basically means, uh, sigma xx you said? Yeah. It basically means the conductivity is zero. So the system is an insulator. In the sense that the voltage you're applying isn't causing any current in the right. direction. Right, right. So it's like, take our semiconductor. Um, if I apply a voltage, right, there's no current flow. because it's an insulator. Mm -hmm. But this, this will turn out to be a different kind of insulator. It's not a band insulator. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I don't quite understand why you say uh, the uh, in experiment for really resistive. I think for whole effect, we kind of inject a current and yeah. see whether there's a voltage yeah. in what direction. So so we, we have a IX and a we buy, and from that we can make it, uh, is it a row x y, but not sigma x y. Uh, no, you can't. So, so you have to get. You can get. 
you cannot get, so in the experiment, you are going to measure this, this thing. You're going to measure voltages and currents, right? So in the experiment, this is what you will measure. Rxy, from which you'll get a sigma xy, which will be the ratio, you know, to go from resistance to resistivity. So let's not worry about that. Oh. That can go on because those are just thickness and length and all of that. But so in the experiment, you'll measure rho xx and rho xy. So, now, what's so, your question? So if we take that ix over dy, so that is not. Sigma you cannot do that. Okay. You cannot do that because that requires this matrix okay. conversion. We do that all the time because usually we are just dealing with a scalar. So if it's a scalar, you can talk about you know V over I, I over V, it's identical. But now we are talking about a matrix object. And that's why I'm alerting you to this. That in the experiment, you would measure voltages, right? You have a constant current source, and then you're measuring voltages along the flow. I mean, no, so there's a voltage which drives this current. So that's the constant current source, and then you're measuring a voltage. And so you're measuring these resistivities. Okay, and life would have been fine, you could have just lived with resistivities. The problem is, to understand why it happens, we have to go to conductivities. Because theoretically, if you remember all our calculations, when we talked about the, the Boltzmann equation, we calculated uh, we have this expression. We didn't do it sigma xy, we calculated j equal to sigma e. So think of how we did our calculation. In our calculation, we had an electric field, and we calculated the current in response to that. And the current was ne times v, and we tried to find that uh, velocity, and you know, we have some uh, integral, some velocity-velocity correlation, as I kept calling it. But Basically, the conductivity turned out to be some kind of a velocity-velocity correlation, you know, integrated over the Fermi surface. So, the theoretical methods give us a way of calculating sigma and not rho. So now we are faced with this uh, situation. Experiment measures rho, the theory calculates sigma, and there's a lot of merit to that because it helps the explanation, especially when we are faced with something like this that we are describing a state where rho is zero and sigma is zero, okay? How do we explain that? So we have to go back to what is calculated. What is calculated is sigma. And that is telling us we need to understand this situation. Why is sigma zero? Um, and so I will come to uh, that question. Uh, try to understand what is this quantum Hall state? Why does it look like an insulator? And then use this property to say, once we understand this, then we understand why rho xx may be looking zero, even though it's not anything to do uh, with superconductivity. In a superconductor, as you know, resistivity is zero. Here, resistivity is zero for a completely different reason. It's zero because the conductivity is zero and the denominator is finite. Okay, now, let's say no more to just try So now comes the Landau levels because when I talked to several of you yesterday, I was sort of uh, riding on the uh, on this notion that you may have done it in your quantum class, but I guess you have not. So I will do a very quick sketch. Interacting electrons. So the Hamiltonian is just P square over 2m 
where P is modified to become the canonical momentum. So my E, I've put the sign of E in that. It's not, not really important. But it's P minus EA, and E is the electronic charge. So I've put a plus, and E is now positive. Okay, not very important. That's the Hamiltonian, and the magnetic field comes in here. Del cross A is the magnetic field. And what we want to do is to solve A psi equal to E psi. Okay, so that's the complete statement of the problem. Now comes, uh, uh, you have to pick a gauge in which to write this vector potential, right? And you can pick several gauges. And for quantum hall, it turns out that both gauges are very instructive. I will only <coughs> discuss, though, the Landau gauge. But if we ever do the fractional quantum hall effect in some later class, we will discuss the other one, which is called a symmetric gauge. Because uh, you cannot understand quantum hall effect for the other Landau levels, like one third the fractional ones, without the symmetric gauge. So you just keep that in mind. And this just says that A is B times something like that. I'm sorry. So there's no x dependence. And that right away tells us that it will commute with Px. And that tells us that our rate functions, psi, um, Px is equal to h by Kx. I always found that strange when I first heard good quantum numbers, like being told you're a good boy or a good girl. You know. But anyway, that's the language. So now psi, which will depend on x and y, will be of the form e to the i kx or pH, Px, uh, times some function phi of y. Okay, That's, that should be the form, because it should be like a plane wave, because in the x, there's no x dependence uh, in the vector potential, so it will, so the Hamiltonian looks like this. Hamiltonian then becomes y over t n p x minus p e b y over c over z. Okay, so this just looks like um, so. There's a p y square. And this is like a y square, but not quite. Okay? So this, this term we are going to rewrite as a, it's a, like a shifted harmonic oscillator. So we will try to get it into the form of a harmonic oscillator we've got. And to do that, I'm going to write y0, which is basically px times c over e times b. So make it all in the other direction. And <coughs> yeah. I'm going to define this, which will be a shift of the harmonic oscillator center. And I'm also going to define a length scale. Define a magnetic, just like a, a harmonic oscillator length. I'm going to define a magnetic length by saying that, remember, we always define lengths by saying B times an area is a flux quantum. So we uh, remember this all the time it comes in. When we define L5, we said B times the system area 
told us how many flux quanta you had. So even here, you have something to say b times um, 2 pi n squared is a flux quanta, uh, is pi naught, which is h c over e. So from here, you can see that l is basically h bar c over e. So this is the magnetic length. And in terms of this then, this harmonic oscillator gets simplified to where y tilde are rescaled variables with the length. So basically y tilde is y divided by L to make it dimensionless. So all the dimensions of the Hamiltonian are out front, h bar omega c. That's the energy scale. Everything else is dimensionless, and it looks like half kx squared plus half m omega square x squared. Sorry, um, t squared over 2m plus half kx squared. That's the harmonic oscillator. So this is y over L and the shift minus L kx or L kx over h bar. And py tilde is basically L py over h bar. Okay? So in terms of this, then you get this Hamiltonian. And that, then we don't need to do any more work. We can just say that implies that we have eigenvalues which are this. N plus half H bar omega C. And so this is now a 1D harmonic oscillator. All the shifts are taken care of. H bar omega C, N goes from 0, 1, 2, etc. These are called the lambda levels. And the wave functions, the size, um, the size is now labeled by the, the quantum numbers, the, the, the size. So it depends on x and y, but are labeled by the quantum numbers, which are n and kx, px. And px or k. And depend on x and y. And this is e to the i, pxx, some polynomial, the Hermite polynomial. and a Gaussian. Okay, so what they look like, so you can see what's happened. If you did not have a magnetic field, the wave functions were just e to the ikx, I, ipx times x, and e to the ipy, p sub y uh, times y, right? They are plane waves in x and y directions. Now when you have a magnetic field, what it looks like is something like this. So um, let me just try to plot. This is what we were calling chi y. So the Hermite polynomials are polynomials of various degrees, right? So the nth degree. So um, let's see. 
uh, basically h0 of x is a constant, h1 of x is something like x, and h2 of x is, you know, we don't need to know, and Wikipedia has nice plots, etc. All I want to say is that hn of x is an nth order polynomial. So it has some n zeros like this. You know, it'll, it'll uh, so here's y. And so what you have is a chi of y basically looks like this. It has uh, a polynomial part, and then it is centered at y0, and around that, the, there's a length overall Gaussian, which is cutting it off. Okay? So you need these Hermite polynomials to make sure every successive uh, state is orthogonal to the previous ones. That's why you need all these zeros, because they cancel weight in the right places to give you orthogonality. And then, this is the important thing here, this magnetic length basically sets a scale over which the weight function uh, collapses. And you get a Gaussian like this, which, uh, you know, so you have some polynomial under that, and then there's a Gaussian. And the scale of this is of order L. So that's what the quantum form state looks like. It's a plane wave state in the x direction, e to the i p x x, and in the y direction it's kind of a localized state uh, on the scale of the magnetic wave. Okay, so um, one more thing, and that is that there is, a, so what we have found is that the energy levels are given by this, but each of these n, if it was just a 1D harmonic oscillator, this would have been the end result. But it turns out because of the other dimension, um, there is a degeneracy in the values of uh, Px. So let me... degenerate levels, N5 levels with the same energy. And that turns out to be, um, so you can actually work that out, it's coming from the Px degeneracy. So uh, what you have is a system like this. Okay. Actually, let me make that picture here. Um, so this is x, and I'm going to apply periodic boundary conditions along x, and this direction here is y, and it's basically saying that my wave function looks like this. It is a little strip which is centered at y0, so here is y0, and um, it has a width which is of order L, and Y0 is a funny object. Y0 is a distance, Y, uh, along the Y direction, but it's actual, Px can change the position of Y. Okay? So it's a, it's a um, so the center of the wave function can be changed by the momentum carried in the X direction. Okay, that's a funny thing about the quantum Hall effect. So position and momentum uh, commutation relations also change. I won't go, go through that, but this is the reason it happens, is that you are seeing a distance here, and you are seeing a momentum also in the same uh, numerator which controls where the center is. Okay, so we don't need all of these details, but they do come up, and um, so we have by, okay, so what we have is that psi x plus lx, this is lx, and this is ly, the total thing here, and psi x plus lx is psi x, that's periodic boundary conditions, 
And that right away tells us that, you know, so this is like the way we did it before. E to the i px lx over h bar is e to the i 2 pi times an integer, q or something. q belongs to z. And from that, we can show that px will be 2 pi h bar over lx times q. And q is an integer. It's a 2n pi. Uh, I, I, maybe I can use m or something. m. m is an integer. Okay, so the... Okay, but px from here is basically... Um, y0, okay, because it, px is controlling the center of this uh, Gaussian. And then I'm going to say that, you know, my y0 could be anywhere between 0 and ly, okay? So that's kind of where, so, you know, here, px is this, but px is, you know, I can think of px as controlling y0, and y0 is a length, which is the total length of the sample is ly. So that's the logic. I'm going to get another length scale into this. So Px is this, and then this is also uh, Eb over C times y0 from here. I don't know how you do this in your notebooks because I just went from there to there. And then I'm going to say that y0 can be anywhere between 0 and Ly, and that will tell me that the number of n that you can have is So that tells me that, um, okay, so I get this, so, so the number of m that you can then have, so y0 lies between, um, let's say, minus n over 2 to ly over 2 to ly over 2, it doesn't matter, it lies in a range 0 to ly, and that says the number of n that you will get is lx ly over 2. So what I've done is I've taken m equal to everything on this side, so it is eb over c, uh, 2 pi h bar, and then the number of m I have replaced, y0 by ly, and that gives me 2 pi h bar, eb over c. And that is nothing but b times an area, lx ly is the area over this is eight c over e. So basically, the degeneracy number of m, which is n prime, the degeneracy is coming out to be total flux over final. Okay. What do you mean by the number of m? The highest m? <coughs> Uh, the total, the total, so for each y0, I'm getting a state, right, a set of states here. Uh -huh. And the question, so I get a stri strip of stri states, and I just make many, so I'm basically dividing ly into uh, these segments of little l, and I'm asking how many such segments can I make. Mm -hmm. So there are many other ways to write this. Uh, essentially, this is what, keep this picture in mind, and ask, you know, I have, uh, my, my oscillators are essentially centered around y0 over a length, magnetic length. How many such magnetic lengths can I fit in? And that gives the degeneracy. Okay? Um, so you can argue it multiple ways. But this is, ultimately it will boil down to uh, the total flux you can get through your system 
divided by the flux quantum. And that will be the degeneracy. So that's telling you you have a certain number of states, uh, depending on the magnetic field, at each of these n. These Landau levels are very degenerate. And that is not just a 1D harmonic oscillator. OK? <coughs> so now, this is where we are. So let me try to end this now very soon. Um, Let me plot this Now comes the explanation. Um, so we, we have, essentially we have this result that En is n plus half h by omega c and there's a degeneracy for each n, which is identical. It need not have been identical, but it is identical for each Landau level. And that is uh, n phi oh, e times area over time. OK, so if I try to plot the density of states as a function of energy, it now looks very discrete. Unlike what we, and as uh, Anisha was saying yesterday, it looks almost like the spectrum of a molecule. A molecule would have a discrete spectrum, except uh, the degeneracy would have been some small thing, you know, three states, 2L plus 1 or whatever. Here, the degeneracy can be macroscopic. Phi naught is a tiny flux quantum, uh, it's a tiny uh, unit. And it's like measuring our debt in units of the penny or something. You know, it's a very large degeneracy. And that's really at the core of what makes the quantum Hall effect so difficult to solve. If you have a very degenerate system, and you try to do a perturbation theory on that, it's, it's, it's a very difficult problem to do. Because you have to, the states get perturbed at the lowest level, and there are n of them, n phi of them. OK, so here is the density of states, uh, n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And basically, um, what these pictures tell you are the way the chemical potential moves through this. Because what we are tuning here is nu. And nu is the density. So I'm going to view this whole thing in the following way nu is n over b phi naught. So I'm going to assume that b is fixed. And n, the density n, is changing. Okay, n is changing. Or you can think of chemical potential nu is changing. They are identical. So, um, now what would happen is, um, especially if I'm changing the chemical potential, <coughs> what would happen is I would be, uh, if I'm looking at a system like this, let's say my chemical potential is somewhere here, and if I, you know, chemical potential is like voltage, right? You, you set your system at some level, and then when you change the chemical potential, the next point it's going to shift to this one because that's the next available state. Okay? But um, so it's not going to explain these plateaus right yet. So we, we have noticed a few things. First thing is, as Andy pointed out yesterday, this is a continuous variable. So if I just was plotting this as a function of mu, it should have been a straight line, like we had in the classical result. Something is making these plateaus. And uh, this is a little long story, and I'm going to cut it short here because we have not discussed disorder in as much length. We have just talked about disorder as a little scattering tau. But actually, disorder does pretty drastic things to the wave functions, high disorder. And it can, in two dimensions, so I have to give you a little background which you have to accept because we can't, this is like a whole different theme. Um, Disorder or random potentials 
play havoc and duty. Uh, play And by that I mean, in 3D, we said, okay, there was a little scattering, tau, that was it, and we got away with it. In 2D, it turns out um, that it completely changes the nature of the state. So what did we have in 3D? We had sort of uh, an electron plane wave state, and then it shifted direction, and shifted direction again every time it scattered. But in between, it was kind of like a plane wave state, more or less, as it scattered between different centers, assuming disorder was not too strong. In 2D, there's actually an exact theorem which says that um, for B equal to zero, all states, all eigenfunctions or all states are localized. Okay? By that I mean that this around some place, and we have some random potential, around some center, the wave function will get localized and will look like this. It has nothing to do with that Gaussian over there. This is just a disorder localization even when there is no magnetic field. It's a very powerful result because what it is saying, for B equal to zero, all states are localized for arbitrary disorder. arbitrary disorder strength. And this uh, thing here, we go like e to the minus r over c localization. Okay. So the nature of the states changes completely. By that I mean, we have plane wave states uh, without disorder. When you put in any amount of disorder, the localization length may be very large. That's not what I'm commenting on. But the form of those wave functions has changed completely from uh, plane wave to something which is localized on some scale C, which of course will depend on disorder. Now, for B not equal to zero, okay, so this is actually an exact theorem. Uh, it is called, um, it's called the gamma form. Uh, result, but um, it's about, uh, so that there are some people associated with it, uh, it's called, let me see, let me just say Anderson at all, because there are four names. I think he has to say the first author, Abraham. Anyway, we associated with Anderson at all, let's say, gang of four. So that's how, as dangerous as we get. Okay, approximately 1979. Okay. Now you ask what, so you know, if it had been um, no disorder, I'm sorry, no B, uh, no magnetic field, basically this says you cannot have a metallic state in 2D. Just, that is gone. Um, I mean, you really need uh, Mason's uh, results. Um, okay, now the question happens for B not equal to zero, what happens? And again, the result is for B not equal to zero, what you can show is all the states are localized except one energy. So you get these. Yeah. Except, so these are all localized. So first thing that happens is those N5 degenerate states spread out, but most of them are localized, except states at one energy. Okay, I'm not saying one state is delocalized, I'm saying one energy. There are states which are delocalized at, this, at the center of the lambda level. So this is extended. By extended, I mean some state which goes across the whole system, and these are all localized, the pink ones. And by localized, I mean those that decay exponentially. Okay, now you can see how what happens here. Um, so I need two more pieces of information. <coughs> so 
So as mu is increased, or mu increased, mu is the chemical potential. So now you can see how sigma is becoming zero. Because when the chemical potential, so when you go through this sequence here, you're essentially going through, uh, you're changing your chemical potential. It's like our EF in the earlier discussions we had. So you have, essentially you're adding fermions to the system. When you add fermions to the system, your chemical potential is moving up. If it is sitting in the localized states, um, sigma xx is zero, so because it's an insulator. Then you hit this delocalized state, and the conductivity increases, and that's this peak here. And then again it becomes zero because you're sitting in these localized states. And then again it hits another one, and you get a, a feature. And the may and as far as sigma xy is concerned, sigma xy just is counting, it's just a counter, counts the number of delocalized states. Below mu, below mu. Okay? So if my uh, chemical potential is here, sigma xy is zero. Then it comes here, you get one, because it now counts one delocalized state below mu, and then two, and so on. It seems like that delocalized state could also conduct along x, though. So why has sigma xx gone back to zero? Um, because sigma xx is a property only of, okay, sigma xy and sigma xx are very different properties. Sigma xx, when we derived in class, was, had always that df by de factor. Delta F zero by delta E. You know, it was always a Fermi, it was always a property of the states at the chemical potential. Okay? Sigma XY is a very different beast. Um, it is a measure of things all the way from zero to the chemical potential. Okay, I don't have time to derive that, but that's a very good question. Usually, transport property, uh, transport coefficients are only probing near the chemical potential. Thermal conductivity, everything. But sigma xy probes everything, it's an integrated quantity, and there is another nice way to write it, which I'm not going to do it now, but uh, there's another way to write it where it's actually an integral from zero to mu, not just properties at the end. Yeah. And so it ends up counting the number of delocalized states below mu, and that's why it just does that. So that's the explanation. When you say pin, do you just mean is? Yeah, is, is. Uh, is pin meaning the very chemical potential is there. Yeah. By pin, I just mean <clears throat> it's, um, it's a, a sense that it's not just moving smoothly. You know, once the chemical potential is at the localized state, it's, it's a little rigid. Okay, but it doesn't, we don't need it for our discussion. But yeah, there is a sense in which I'm using the word pinning that it doesn't just move when you add the next electron, it may be somewhat resistive to that. So that's the explanation. It uh, sounds uh, very, uh, you know, very simple. Uh, because uh, the next quote, I'm going to give you an even simpler explanation. And then I'm going to tell you how uh, that this simple explanation doesn't act explain the fractional stuff, but that's where we have to leave this discussion. Okay, now, 
So let's see, do, do you have any questions on this? Um, yeah. So, so when there is no magnetic field applied, sigma xx is zero also? Or because you said all the states are be all localized uh, without a magnetic field. Right, so sigma xx is zero always. 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 So you might say, what happened to our Druda conductivity? So this is actually just without even a magnetic field. Um, this itself is a big field of study, was a big field of study in the 80s. Called, so, so the whole thrust at that time was the following. So uh, this is now 2D, let me keep this going here. 2D, V is zero, and uh, sigma is now, you know, you start with this Druder, any square tau over n, and then I'm saying 2D, V is zero with disorder, so, we, so with disorder, sigma should be zero, okay? And this was a big field of study called localization, and in fact, to understand that, what people tried to do was, uh, uh, was even do perturbation theory, you know, like weak disorder. And they were able to show that you start with sigma, which is sigma, uh, n squared tau over m, and you get corrections to that, which are, let's say, logarithmic, something like the log L over L, or you can even have temperature there if you want to put in temperature, but basically those corrections showed that as your system went to bigger and bigger sizes, and you picked up the contribution of all these localized states, the conductivity would be driven to zero, because this was subtracting from that. So this was a big field of study, and a lot was known from that. Okay, uh, Mason, would you step over here and... So we will touch on this last bit again. I want to show uh, what Andy had uh, done last quarter, where we look at low fields. So here what we had was these Landau levels, and they were well separated. And once they are well separated, you get these very nice plateaus. But in uh, magneto transport, it's not just quantum Hall effect. It's also what happens at low fields. And I will show you that uh, tomorrow. Okay. So, Mason, here is what you might uh, try to focus on first. This is where I heard a lot of people had difficulty. Uh, they were able to look at four sites. But when the time came to look at the density of states, you need many sites. At least, I would say, 100 or more to get some kind of a, you know, smooth curve. So show the part where you might be generating the big ladder. Okay, yeah, so the idea is to make Mathematica make the matrix for you so you don't have to do it by hand. Exactly. And um, just um, the kind of, I don't use many like Mathematica functions, but the one that you really need is um, making matrices with these tables. And I don't know if you guys have done that before, if that's a familiar command. Um, so. Um, a table is just a list of, you know, a list of lists, or it's a list, and that's what uh, Mathematic interprets as matrices. And so, like, here's an example. You tell it what to put um, for i and j, and then it scans through j and i. So here, um, just saying that add i and j, and then those are both going to go from 1 to 3. That'll generate a 3 by 3 matrix. So you see what the output is. It's 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2. Uh, three and so on. And so then, if you wanted a bigger one, you could just change the dimension here. If you wanted it to be 100 by 100, it would do that automatically. Um, okay. And so now, for our specific case, just go through a few steps, just like you would normally do it by hand, but then just telling Mathematica what to do at each stage. So the first thing is to make the diagonal part. <coughs> and so, um, identity matrix is just the uh, uh, n-dimensional identity matrix. So here it's 6 by 6, and then it's putting 2Ks along the diagonal. We want a defect, so the next part um, is to go in and um, say that maybe we want to put the defect in the middle. So replace part will replace this element, the element that um, the dimension divided by 2, that row and that column, and then make an arrow and 
didn't say what you wanted to replace it with. <coughs> so <clears throat> I replace the defect, and then that affects the site above it and the site below it. Um, I, mean, the, it, I don't know exactly. You're just making doing. up something. This is not putting into any particular part of our question. What's that? Right. You're, I just want to... you're just putting a defect. I mean, in 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 the actual problem, the defects were KK prime defects and or yeah. I, or I yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. G is K prime. Yeah. yeah. G, G is, is K, K prime. prime. G is K prime. Um, and so the whole idea though here is right. It's this. And the end, as I mentioned, it's generally can change at the beginning. It'll change everything in your code. Um, so, okay. But just stop me if like something is unfamiliar. Because um, if you haven't seen these things before, I know they're confusing. It's all language. Okay. And now the spring defects. They have the diagonal elements, and then there are the off-diagonal elements that connect the two springs. And so the way I did this was again. <clears throat> making a matrix using these tables, and then Mathematica has these built-in um, conditional arguments, like if, so if you've written any sort of computer program, of if statements. So how many people have uh, written some kind of computer program you know, with if and so on? Okay. Pretty much. Okay. And so for the off diagonal elements, you want to check if the column is one more than the row, right? That will give you whatever one of the off diagonals, and then for the other one, you want to check if the row is one more than the column. And so I say, check if k plus one equals i, um, mod is the boundary conditions, right? Um, and if it's true, that means you're on the upper diagonal, and so you want to, um, you want to put a, an element there that isn't zero, right? And then you have to check if you're at the defect site or if you're at just a regular K to K spring, and so that's the second if. If you're at the defect site, um, then put in the defect. If not, put in a regular spring constant. And if both of those aren't true, you're not on the diagonal, so you want to put it at zero. Yep. Right. Uh, a couple points that might not be obvious. Someone's not done yes. programming in mathematics right here. Um, Notice if you're asking if this thing is equal to that thing, you want to use equals equals rather than just one equal sign. Yes. Um, also, the yeah the this yeah that's the or statement there. Two pipes. Um, you can find it on your keyboard. Shift the thing on the backspace. Um, and then um, the if statement is if the thing to test whether it's true or not comma, the thing to do if it is true, comma, the thing to do if it is not true. So if you want to go, if this is true, then do that, then if not, do this, um, which is usually the if then else statements in other programming languages. Here you have to throw the next if statements into the else part. So it's if, and so if you look um, with the end there, it's if the thing he's testing, comma, and then he's throwing in another if statement. So he's, these ifs are inside each other. It's, uh, yeah. So you, just, you have to read your way through it. So the next thing is you can just uh, get help. That I use help all the time on Mathematica. I you give you the syntax. Mm -hmm. document documentation center and you can even just click on the command itself. What is it? Yeah. Something F1. Yeah. F1. Yeah. And then it takes you into the command center. Mm -hmm. Document yeah. center. Um, and so this is the those off the angle ones that's the output. So let's put them one over and the defect is here. So here's the defect springs and then the regular springs. bottom diagonal, and then there's one can, and then it didn't say you want to add the three matrices. Adding matrices is just like adding numbers. So you say, I take my diagonal matrix, add the upper one and the lower one, and calling that again. So at this point, we're here, which looks good, right? <coughs> Defect, it's got the, it's connected by 2G. 
two springs, and then here there's a G and a K, because these two springs have a G on one side and a K on the other. Um, and now if you wanted to make it 100 by 100, all you had to do was change that. Is that clear? One number at the beginning. Is clear? So um, I know a lot of you have struggled with it, uh, just at the 4 by 4 site level. So now what we will do is, um, it makes us as a mind, I know there are many of you who have done it also. I know several of you know this stuff. So, you know, we, in the interest of everyone kind of learning as a chemical potential, so to say, coming up, we will post this part so you can now play with that and go to the next step. You still have to interpret your results with English. Okay. <laughs> um, other questions? Because if you haven't seen this before, it's probably overwhelming. Skip things that. Quick technical question: yeah. How did you introduce the masses later on? Oh sure, yeah. So I did it. Um, we talked about like. So you should look at my notes where I discuss the mass. Did you look at that? Well, I just meant technically how. Did uh, technically, it? okay. Oh, so technically, I made so. This is the equation, right? Yeah. Is, these are matrices. So, constructed this mass <coughs> matrix in the same way that we've done it before. Took the inverse multiply. So, finally, this would be the dynamical matrix that you would find the eigenvalues of. You see, once again, we alert about the fact that it's not just 1 over n um, time. I mean, you don't just take the previous dynamic matrix and just divide all the k's by m's or m prime. But you have to do this. 